I'm James Blower, uh, founder of The Savings Guru, and I'm here today in Kent with One Savings Bank. Uh, one Savings Bank was one of the first banks to come in the new wave of, of new entrants in the uh, early 2010s. As you can see, pretty impressive stable of brands uh, within their portfolio. And today I'm here to speak to Will Davies, who's the head of savings at One Savings Bank, about all things savings. So let's go and see what he's got to say. We're here today with um, Will Davies, who is the head of savings of, of One Savings Bank. Oh, um, Will, you've got within your stable of, of brands the, the Kent Reliance brand. So um, that's a brand that you predominantly use for, for saving. So Correct, can, yeah. can you talk me through how, how the bank got started? What's the sort of evolution of, of Kent Reliance into the market? Yeah, of course. So Kent Reliance is very similar to a lot of other building societies and some PLCs for that matter, in that we, uh, we can trace our evolution back to about 150 years ago when lots of smaller building societies merged with other building societies and eventually came much bigger and bigger building societies. And then Kent Reliance was formed 20 or 30 years ago and for, continued as a building society right up until 2011 when we evolved into a bank and that's where one savings bank became our primary business and Kent Reliance was a brand that we held on to. So what made One Savings decide to become a bank then? So in 2008, the financial crisis had taken its toll on, on a lot of um, institutions in the market and we needed to have a, a capital injection. And in 2011, when we formed, the rules were quite restrictive on how a building society received that capital injection. Um, you essentially had to receive the money from your members yep. um, and we weren't prepared to go out to the members to ask for that level of capital. So we went out to the private market and JC Flowers, an American investment firm, came forward, they saw an opportunity and they decided to give us a, the, the injection of, of, of money that we needed. But in order to receive that money, we had to become a bank. So we, in February 2011, we became a bank, and then we received the money from JC Flowers, which has then helped us become a, a successful bank. So what's your proposition to savers in the market? So our proposition is essentially to offer simple savings products that offer long-term customer value. So whilst we have a lot of variable rate products, and variable rate products can move up as well as down, we have a... Um, our proposition is to make sure that we never drop to the same level that you might see on the high street. So you sometimes hear about accounts that pay 0.05%. We have a proposition to say we will always be within the top 10% of best payers on the market. Um, we always have a product that's within the best buys. Um, and if you're a longer term saver with us, then when your products mature, so a fixed rate bond for example, when your product matures, the product that you're offered as a retention product at the end of that maturity will be better than we offer to new customers. So right. we try to make sure that we always offer a better product to existing customers so that they continue to get long-term value. It won't always be the best, but it will always be long-term value. Um, and to that end, we, we see about 90%, I think last year it was 89% of our customers who rolled off long-term products retained with us, they stayed with us. And I think for the industry, that's, that's pretty impressive. No bank I've worked for before has seen kind of near on 90% retention. Yeah, that is, that's very, um, very high retention rate. Mm. Oh, but you have a wide range of customers as well, don't you? So it's not just personal customers that you look yep. after. You have propositions for non-personal as well. Correct, yep. So we have a SME um, savings product, so small to medium-sized enterprises. Um, it's generally for kind of directors of firms of small, smaller businesses is, is where we're going for. Um, and that offers, I think that is currently the best paying rate available in the market. So what, what do you offer in the marketplace that's unique or, or different from, from competitors? Our proposition, our intention is to offer a traditional saving service to customers. Um, if you are a customer and you want to go into a branch, you, you know the old days where you might have gone into your bank and you put your suit on because you've seen the branch manager. So we, you don't have to wear a suit to go into our <laughs> branches, but if you want to go into our branch and sit down and have a conversation with Julie behind the counter for the next 30 minutes and talk about your holiday or your new granddaughter, 
then that's totally cool. If you want to go into a branch and spend three minutes, do your transaction and get out, that's also cool. If you want to pick up your phone and do a withdrawal very quickly, that's fine. But no matter what channel you come through us, whatever, whatever channel you decide to open your account, make your withdrawals, you can always go to a branch and sit down and have a, quite a peaceful experience. And I can guarantee you that during that time that you're in the branch, you will never be sold to. We don't do any selling. Um, we, we only have targets for customer service. Um, so you go in, you spend as much time in the branch as you want, do whatever business you need to do in the branch, and then you can leave knowing that you're not, you're not walking out with a product that you maybe didn't go in for. It's interesting you mentioned cust customer service and measuring that. How, how, can you tell us a bit more about how you, how you go about that? Yeah, yeah. So at the beginning of every year, we get all yeah. the branch managers in a room and we say, your customer satisfaction scores are this, your NPS scores are this, and then at the end of every year, you have to have increased your NPS, your net promoter score, and your customer satisfaction score by 10%. And okay. then we sit down the next January and say, this is what it is you've either succeeded or you failed. How did you succeed? And we go around the table with all the branch managers and say, what went well, what didn't go well? And then we try to develop the proposition constantly. We have a customer forum where we kind of always talk about what we can do best for the customer. And then during that we say, how can we increase our NPS? And that's the only thing we care about with that proposition. You, you talked about the branches there. You're, you're obviously one of the few banks that are, have come new into the market that do have a, a branch network. I think it's nine you've got across it is. Kent and yep. the South East. Do, do customers value those? Do you, do you get a different level of response from customers that use branches? What, what's the kind of feeling? I am delighted, personally delighted, that we're one of the few banks that have actually expanded their branch network in the past few years. Um, we opened a, a new branch in Little Hampton uh, last year. And the reason we do that is because as part of this customer forum, we have a panel of customers who we go out to and we ask questions about, you know, it might be, what do you, like, what do you think about this form? What, what do you think about the colors on this flyer? We ask them sometimes some quite basic questions, but one of the messages that always comes out is, we love the fact that you have a branch network. And we even have customers who don't live in the Southeast. We have customers who don't even live in England. We've got Scottish customers who say, we love the fact that you have a branch because if I wow. want to go and talk to somebody about my money, I know I can get in my car and I can get to the branch and I can talk to someone. You don't have to make an appointment. You can turn up. If you want to talk to the manager, you might have to wait a minute or two for the manager to become available, but you can get there and you can talk to someone that day about your financial um, situation. And that, to me, is one of the really key drivers about, about personal banking. It's all very well kind of doing everything digitally, but when you can look at someone in the eye and you can have a conversation about your savings, that to me is our proposition. Yeah. And as I said a minute ago, you will never be cross-sold, you will never be um, upsold. no one will ever try and sell you a product that you don't want to have. Everything is about 100% customer service in the branch network. So it, the branch network to me is, is one of the jewels of our crown in the in do you find it supports other channels? Do you find it uh, it provides reassurance maybe to some of the digital customers and the Definitely. online customers? Yeah. Definitely, yeah. yeah so mm -hmm. we, we get customers, as I say, the Scottish one is a great example. It was a guy who opened his account online, he liked the product, he liked the value that he was getting from it, and so he, he was added to this customer panel who, who we asked questions to, and he says, I will probably never go to Gravesend in my life, but I like the fact that I could drive to Gravesend. So yeah. it, it just adds to that kind of, that certainty that you can do good business with us. I think it provides a little bit of security to customers, a bit of reassurance that I it's there. Right. I don't yeah. think that it's not always that they necessarily need to use it, but yeah. the fact it's there and it's uh, yeah. Um, yeah, a, com a source of comfort. Yeah, there, there are a lot of problems that can go on with digital only banking yeah um, you know we, we see we've examples, seen that yeah, yeah very recently and if there isn't somewhere that you can go what do you do yeah and and yes yeah, so i'm you know whether we expand much further i don't know uh, you know we we have a good heartland in, yeah. in kent um and and slightly further out um whether we go to 10 branches 15 branches it may be unlikely yeah but having some branches that you can go to i think is really valuable
So you were obviously one of the first of the, the wave of new banks to, to come to the market. What, what have you made personally of the changes since that have happened in the marketplace? Yeah, hasn't it been amazing? So I think it's been a, probably the best time to be in banking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so what was it? Back in 2008, there was a handful of banks and then was it Metro first in yeah. 2011, then us, then Virgin, and, and since then, what have we got, 20 or 30 new banks? Yeah. Another speculation of 20 or 30 new banks that we're probably going to come out soon. Yeah. Um, so I, I think largely positive. It's, it's, it's difficult to really think about any negatives of that. So the, the regulation has tightened up. Every bank has new capital requirements, new liquidity requirements. And um, so we're essentially safer than we probably were post, yep. uh, pre-2008. But then there's also the financial services compensation scheme has come in since then. And you, you've been around as long as I have. You know that. You know. Thanks. <laughs> Longer, actually. <Yeah. laughs> Before 2008, it was the financial services compensation scheme was you get 100% of the first three grand and then 90% yeah. of the ne next 40 or something like that. It was really complicated. Now it's just 85 grand. Everyone's covered. So if you're in one of these new banks and you've got, you're regulated by the FCA, they're regulated by the FCA, and they have financial services um, compensation scheme cover, that's brilliant, right? You, you know, yeah. You know, you're nice and secure. Great for customers. Yeah. Um, there's, there's so many new banks that have got new propositions, new products, interest rates are probably being kept up by those new, um, those new banks that yeah. are kind of a little bit liquidity, um, uh, have a, a higher liquidity requirement. Um, I suppose the only downside has been the interest rate environment. Yeah. Know, bank of England base rates being at 0.5%, um, well, 025 to 0.5% for so long yeah. that customers aren't getting great value and we're trying our best to offer the best value we can but you know long gone are the days of the five percent six percent seven percent fixed rate bonds when i first started going it was uh six and six and three quarters six point seven five percent on a five year uh, and six percent on a one year yeah. uh, i can't find it hard to believe that i have still got the materials to remind me yeah. they were actually out there but i find it hard to believe now I'm, and I'm not sure we'll go back there anytime no, I'm soon. Not, I'm uh, not. I think, but, but I think it all changed in so like prior to 2003, prior to ING coming in the market. Well, the only real opportunity you had to save was through the big banks, yeah. and they weren't offering great rates. They were still offering considerably less than bank base rate. Yeah. And ING came in and they said, "Oh, we're going to do an easy access account at five percent," and all the big banks went, "What?" You can't do that. <laughs> but then, and then, so everyone had to up their game a little bit, and that was yeah. one provider. Now we've got 20 or 30 providers, and the bank base rate is 0.5, but you can get 1.3 on an easy access. Yeah. So that's a lot different to what it was in kind of 15 years ago. Yeah. So what's it going to look like in 15 years' time? I don't know. I'm no, no, I'm no rate predictor, but it seems like it's going one way to me. I think well, I think it's probably only room for it to go yeah. one way now. Uh, I think we've probably seen the bottom, yeah. Uh, yeah. but it's just how quickly that that happens. We've seen yeah. a little push up this year, but it's very marginal. Yeah. Uh, and last yeah. year was a little shift up. Uh, I think it's personally going to be incrementally for for a little while. Let's hope yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So. Do you have any plans that are coming down the down a pipeline for cu for customers? Any new products or services or initiatives that you're you're yep. thinking about bringing to market? That you can share. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> Put you on the spot. We, <laughs> we are we're embarking on a new strategy of service proposition. So as I mentioned in the last question, yep. there are so many new banks and they were all offering different services and. We want to continue to be traditional. We want to continue to be the friendly face of banking that you can go and speak to. I, I always mention Julie because Julie's wonderful in Gravesend. Um, you can go and talk to Julie and have a great time. But we also recognize that we're now in 2018. We probably need to enhance our technical offering. Yeah. Um, so if you want to do things on your phone, but then ring up or then send a letter, then that's totally cool. So where enhancing our digital proposition, but we are spending exactly the same amount of money enhancing our branch technology as we are enhancing our digital technology. Okay. So it's not that digital is suddenly going to become wonderful and then you'll go into a branch and like some high street banks, 
yeah, you don't even see tired. the person. Yeah. So this will be digital's really good, and also the branches are really good. So it's just about making everything smoother, slicker, easier to use. And if you are that customer who wants to get in and get out, that's fine. You you do your banking however you want to do your banking. If you're that customer who wants to take your time, that's cool as well. But we will have the systems and the technology to allow you to bank with us however you want to bank with us. All right. Are you feeling uh, a pressure to, to keep up with some of the, the newer banks that are coming in, some of the, the digital only, some of the app-based banks? Is, is some of it driven by, by that? Is there a, a, a desire to kind of keep, up, keep pace with some of that? Yeah, and it's, it's not, we're not necessarily trying to keep up. We, we don't want to be the next fintech. We don't want to be the leader on the, on the cutting edge of technology. We just want to offer, we just want to match the customer's expectations. Yeah. And the customers are now using Uber and Amazon and they've got these really slick digital propositions. And I don't, I don't want you to be able to open an account in one click. I think that's probably too easy. I think you, you, you need to understand what you're opening before yeah. you, you open it. So I don't want it to be as good as everybody else, but it just has to keep pace. Um, so yes, we're feeling some pressure, but we're not really feeling it from your, your starlings and your atoms who have got a really good digital proposition. We're just feeling it from the general kind of evolution of technology. And as I say, we, we, do, we just want to be we don't want to be old-fashioned. We want yeah. to be traditional, but not old-fashioned. It's interesting you mentioned you know, companies like Amazon and Uber who mm. are sort of well-known for having a, a great digital experience. It's mm. probably the first time for a, lot, for a long while we've seen maybe banking look outside the sort of traditional boundaries and yeah, look yeah. at other fintechs, yeah. but look more broadly than financial services. Mm. So mm. A lot of innovation in the past has, has perhaps come from within the sector or within similar sectors. Yeah. But yeah, I think we're seeing more banks looking across the uh, the kind of more traditional boundaries and looking at other industries that are, perhaps have very little in common, but they have yeah. customers at the end of it. Uh, because I think I think people are realising now that customers customers aren't going to a bank to buy a product. People are going to a bank to fulfil a promise. I will give you X amount of money, and in return, you will give me that yeah. return back. Or I will borrow from you this amount of money and in return I will pay you this amount of money every month and at the end of my term I will have paid you this much. And it's not about you're coming in for a mortgage, it's about you're coming in to help us fulfil something that you want to achieve yeah. and in doing that, this is the promise that we, we made to each other, this is the contract we have between each other. And other services do that. Amazon say you want to buy something through Amazon Prime, we promise it will be with you tomorrow. Yeah. If you want to pay an extra quid or whatever, four quid, whatever it is, we'll have you it before 12 o'clock. And as soon as people start breaking those promises, well, that's when the whole service proposition falls apart. So for us, it's about fulfilling the promises we make to the customers, doing, doing what we say we're going to do and doing it well. What changes do you think we will see in the market then over the, in the next five years? Uh, what can we expect? What's your, your views? Yeah, I, th I think it's going to be an interesting five years and, and beyond. So... Oh. TFS, term funding, and FLS have yep. all come to an end in February. So what does that mean? That means we're probably going to have to utilise the customer a little bit more and put more effort into making sure that we keep the customer happy. Now, the, the government's been feeding the industry this cheap money for, for the last few years. Well, that's no longer available. So the customer now is number one. The customer's yep. now key to everybody. So I think that's going to create a big change. And that coupled with all the new banks. So new banks in the early days, they, they don't need a lot of cash. They're not, they don't need a lot of customers. But as they become more established, then they, start, they, become, they need more liquidity. So then they become more competitive. Yeah. Um, so I think the, the lack of TFS, the established newer banks, or the newer banks becoming established, are important. But then there's the technology changes. So artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, biometrics, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, blockchain. What's going to happen with that? Well, at the moment, it doesn't seem like there's a lot happening. There's a lot of people talking about it. There's a lot of people um, kind of making assumptions or predictions about what's going to happen. And But it hasn't impacted anything yet. But 
will, is it Bitcoin, will that become a valid currency that we're all buying things with, transacting with? Possibly. Will blockchain become a, a key driver for moving money or moving documentation? Will that help mortgages go through quicker? I think there's a, there's a, there's a really exciting time for technology. And as I say, we're not going to be the fintech that starts it. We don't want to be a fintech, yeah. but we're happy to embrace new technologies if that's what the customer wants to use. Um, digital wallets. Fairly, fairly simple to, to create. I say that I'm not the techie guy who has to create it, but you know th there are ways to create digital wallets. So if people yeah. want to start saving in digital wallets, then why not? Um, one of the big ones is obviously PSD2 and the, the um, now open banking, the APIs that you have that allow you to open accounts through non-banks, yeah. which I think is going to be a really interesting, um, really interesting kind of turn for the industry. Suddenly, these apps that don't have any branches, that don't hold any of your money, uh, but are now kind of advising you or giving you positive nudges about what you should do with your money or trying to sell you a credit card because they know that in a year's time or in three months' time, you're going on holiday and you haven't saved enough to go, uh, saved up enough to go on holiday. What, what what does that really mean? And you know, I'm I I I I'm really interested to just see how, how that kind of pans out. But then there's a, so so there's new banks becoming more established. But then there's some more established banks that are consolidating, and I probably won't name them because there's probably still lots of changes to to come. But you don't have to Google very far to find a number of banks who have had either takeover offers or have yeah. merged with with larger banks, so will all the banks that are here now still be here in five years' time? Probably not. And will the technology we use really enhance the way that customers utilise their service? Possibly, but I still think there will be customers who still want the traditional banking um, service, and that's why we're still, we're, we're still investing to make sure that we're, we're ready for the future. We want our digital service to be better, but we also want to make sure our branch service is, is spot on. You mentioned consolidation and takeovers there, and it's, it's hard to uh, predict who's going to be mm. next, but I think it's probably a race in certainty in the next two or three years we're going to see some, yeah, yeah, some consolidation sure. and some mm. activity in the sector. Just, mm. It's just probably not viable to have 30-odd banks and 30, 40 in the queue come yeah, in, yeah. though, yeah. That, that they'll all survive as individual entities. Yeah, and... and yeah. So, so, and most of the banks are profitable, from what I understand. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, is it going to be, well, we'll just buy them because they're really good at technology, or we'll buy them because they're really good at credit cards, or maybe I'll just buy them because I'm super rich and I just want to have an inflow of cash because they're generating so much money on, on however, however long it's going to be. So I think, I think I'm really keen to see what happens with some of the more established banks over the next few years. Okay. You also talked about um, term funding scheme mm. and the funding for lending scheme come coming to an end at the end of February, mm. and uh, there's quite a lot of speculation in the market that that will that will be good for for savers. Do you think it will be a good thing? The end of those schemes, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's been around for is it four years? I think yeah. it's been around yeah. for, and so certainly some of the larger banks who have been kind of uh, been taking quite large deposits from term funding scheme, then they can suddenly say. Well, we've spent all that now. We've we've do, it, we we used it to help inject some money into the mortgage market, and that's what it was for. But now we don't need to inject money into the mortgage market because that's working well. I mean, I don't work in yeah. mortgages, so I probably shouldn't comment too too far on mortgages. But now the big banks are going to be looking to the savings and going right. Sorry, we ignored you for the past few years, <laughs> but here's the new service that we're going to offer you. Here's a new product. Here's a better rate, and I, I think. I think it's. I should be on the big banks for losing the TFS more than the kind of smaller ones like us. Yeah, I think we're going to see a period of activity. I think uh, I probably disagree with some some of the people who uh, seem to expect and that's going to come overnight. I think we'll see a, a gradual runoff probably mm. through the rest of this year and, and into next year while that money gets used up. I think people kind of think it's a kind of sharp cut off date and. Everything changes after yeah, that, and I think yeah. it's, it's not. It'll be a slower yeah. burn. Uh, people are forgetting that that cash is still there in a lot of cases and, yeah. and will run off over a period of time. But yeah. I think you're right. I think we'll see 
a lot of uh, people who haven't been in the market are suddenly forced to, to start engaging with customers and, and putting together more compelling yeah. propositions. It puts, makes the customer king again. Yeah. And I think that's um, awkward. Yeah. Uh, that's important. Yeah. Obviously, one of the, the things that the, the government's introduced has been the, the personal savings uh, allowance recently. And uh, yeah, that's had, uh, seems to have had an impact on ISAs in the market. Do you, do you think we'll see further changes to either the, the personal savings allowance or to, to ISAs themselves as a result? The personal savings allowance is clearly wonderful. It's taken 95% of customers in the UK out of taxation on their savings. Yeah, that, that can be nothing but a good thing. Um, ISAs have taken £300 billion worth of customers out of taxation for the past 20 years. So I think a lot of people are now turning their back on ISAs because they yeah. think, well, the PSAs is around, everything's fine. Customers are already not paying tax up to £1,000 uh, of interest. So why, why do we need an ISA anymore? But when that thousand pounds limit is reached, then a customer is paying tax. Or if a government, because it's just a form of, it's a tax cut. Yeah. So when the government, as, as governments do say, we're no longer going to have that tax cut, I think it will be a lot more palatable for a, for, for a government to get rid of the personal savings allowance than it will for them to get rid of ISAs. Now, ISAs are so established in the savings market now. ISA is my core savings product, which I always open first, as, as soon as I can on the 6th of April every year, and then my money goes into that. And once I go outside of that, then once I, once I build out uh, above, the, um, above the balance, which is quite difficult now, that it's £20,000, um, but that it's always the first, the first yeah. thing that I open. And PSAs are, are, are nice, is a nice to have, but will it still be around in 10 years' time? That's not for me to decide, that's for the government to decide, but I just know it's a lever the government can pull, and I think the ISA is a, 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 a much less likely lever for them to pull. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with you on that. I think it'd be difficult to, um, to cull the ISAs, and if you look at the kind of ISA history, it was originally the TESSA. Mm. Uh, um, so I think... Toises, you know, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe rebranded, but yeah. um, I, I can't see that that, that will, will go. The personal savings allowance looks like the obvious one to either cut the mm. amount or yeah. to tinker with. I, I don't. I think some people are thinking it might be like ISAs, and we'll see a gradual rise every year in the allowance. But yeah. I don't think it will be. It will be that. Although one thing that may help Treasury is if we start to enter a rising interest rate environment, you can leave the allowance as is and effectively bring more people in anyway because yeah, rates yeah. rise yeah, sure. and and therefore mm. more people come come out of the allowance yeah. go out, go over the uh, the limits. So. Well, look at it. 10 years ago when average rates were 5%, maybe, maybe a little lower than that, um, almost everybody was earning over a thousand pounds a year. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, an it's hard rate. not to, Precisely, yeah, yeah, for an yeah. average saver. Yeah, yeah. Um, whereas now you've got to be, a, you've got to have what, 70 grand, 60 grand? Yeah, to, if you're basically a taxpayer. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, a, it's a lot. Yeah, no. but you're right. If, if interest rates do, I mean, they use the term normalise, which I, I don't know if I really agree with, but if interest rates do start hitting the 3 4 5% mark again, yeah. more and more people are going to be paying tax. So yeah. what do you need to stop paying tax? You need a nicer. And so that's why we, so we've, we've really consistently invested in our ISA proposition, because even though it's, it's not the, the big ticket in town, it's not the big game in town at the moment, we think it will be, and we want to be ready for when customers are ready to start putting money in their ISAs, yeah. ISAs again. Um, I mean, and then you've got things like the Help to Buy ISA, the Lifetime ISA, just wonderful products, absolutely wonderful products. You're getting 25% from the, from the government. Yeah. Who wouldn't have one of those? But yeah. Someone else. If you qualify. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Too old, no way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, it's interesting you um, you mentioned that. I think uh, possibly one of the things that might I could see happening with ISAs is perhaps some consolidation. We've got rather a large number of them. You've got the you know the long term ISA. You've got help to buy ISA. You mentioned yeah. you've got cash ISAs. You've got stock yeah. shares. You've even got innovative to finance ISAs. I do wonder whether someone in Treasury might sit there and say mm. we perhaps need to tidy this yeah. this up. It's gone from being a really simple yeah. product, a yeah. uh, three thousand pound pot, yeah. uh, into Quite a um, quite a variety yeah. now, and that probably simplicity has perhaps gone Definitely, for consumers. Yeah, because so. yeah, they went through a period of let's 
let's launch ISIS. So they launched the ISIS back in was it the late 90s. And yeah. they said, so we've launched ISIS, but you can only have 3,000 in a cash or 3,000 in a stocks and shares. Yeah. And then they said, well, now you can have 7,240, whatever it was, and you can put half in a cash, half in a stocks and shares, but never the two shall meet. And, but then they said, let's simplify it. You can put everything in stocks and shares, everything in a cash. It doesn't matter. You can transfer between the two when the nicer, the new ISA yeah. came out. And that was, <laughs> all right, great. And then they've gone, now you can have an innovative ISA. Now you can have a help to buy ISA. But if you have a help to buy ISA, you can only put 250 quid a month into it. And then you go, go into it and it's like, oh, gosh, now I'm yeah. struggling to keep up with it. So, um, yeah, I, I would like to probably see a bit of simplification in, in the ISA market because they're great products. Yeah. But they're just overly complicated, in my view. So while we're on the uh, stargazing then, if you, uh, if you could be, uh, be running the Treasury for a day or Prime Minister for a day, what... What change would you introduce for for savers? What would you what would you do? What would be the one thing you'd you'd think that would be that would be the thing I'd change? So, oh, wow, well, that's putting that on the spot, isn't it? So, if I was in charge of Treasury, I think the like say, lifetime ISA, brilliant. Thank you very much, Treasury. You've done us all a humongous favour. You're giving every citizen, if they're eligible, twenty five percent. Wow, that's that's amazing. The PSA, the personal savings allowance, you've taken 95% of people out of tax. Absolutely brilliant. Congratulations. That's, that's really what we want to help kind of ignite the market. What I think probably could have done, could have happened a little bit better is if the Treasury engaged with the industry, look at Lysis, yeah. lifetime Lysis, one person, yeah. one, one cash provider is providing a lifetime ISA. Why is only one providing it? Because they're so complicated to run. If the government said to us, because the government don't deal with customers. Yeah. We deal with customers. We understand customers. So if the government came to us and said, we're prepared to give a 25% bonus, annual bonus, on, on up to a certain amount of money that goes into this particular ISA product, now you as an industry go away and decide how that should look and come back and tell us, I'm pretty certain we could have come up with something a bit better. Well, we wouldn't have got what we've got now, that's for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so for me, it's just about engaging, engaging early. And you know, during the Lifetime ISA launch, it was oh, and the Help to Buy ISA launch, and, and some of the changes with the um, Financial Services Compensation Scheme, you'd find out in April that you have to launch it in December. Well, that doesn't give us time. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we want to really think this through and do it well. And I, I, as I say, I think if it was industry-led innovation with the government, I'm not saying just give us yeah. free reign. I want to work with the government to create something rather than the government just saying, this is what we want you to do, and the industry not, not taking it up. Yeah, I think the, if, you, if you look at the Cameron and Osborne administration, it was... Uh, it was marked with, with with lots of new innovation for for savings, uh, but but a complete kind of lack of consultation with yeah, yeah. with industry, and and I think the result of we've got is that some of the stuff has come come through, some of it's not been delivered that that yeah. well, but yeah. it was that lack of engagement with the industry to, yeah. as you say, to say yeah, what you know what are the pitfalls with with this, uh, yeah. yeah, some of the cases it was even. Um, you know, civil service didn't even know that uh, some of the stuff that yeah, they were doing yeah. in the world, it was yeah. yeah it fell off the uh, off the cuff um, almost uh, yeah. um, and I, I can't uh, I can't see anyone else um, joining the uh, the the LISA market uh, anytime time soon. We might see one or two mm. new providers, but there's certainly I can't see a rush of, of people coming to. Well, this is it. The one provider that, that we have selling it. They can just pay whatever interest they want, and they, yeah. they could slash the interest rate tomorrow for one, and I, I, I don't believe they will, but they could no, just slash the no. interest rate if they wanted to do, and then what do the customers do? It's what not the outcome, is it, that yeah. everyone that would have hoped for? Yeah, so. yeah. Well, it's been absolutely fascinating to uh, to chat through. Um, yeah, I know you're as passionate about the industry as, as I am, so thank you very much for your, your time, and uh, we'll continue to follow your your progress well. Uh, Anytime. Uh, thank you very much. Cheers, Will. Thank cool. you. Thank you.